Welcome to my podcast, The Laura Dowling Experience. Many of you will know me from my Instagram page, at Fabulous Pharmacist, where I love to shine a light on topics that people normally shy away from. Today I spoke with Mr. John Lonergan, the former governor of Mount Joy Prison. We discussed the cycle of poverty, education, addiction and mental health issues, and how these factors can contribute to someone ending up in prison. We had such a heartfelt and meaningful discussion. I hope that you come away from this podcast with a better understanding of how people that end up in prison are just people like you and I. To support the Lord Island experience, please check out our sponsors in the podcast notes below. Enjoy the show. John, it's lovely to have you here today to speak with me about your your life as a prison governor and also the prison service and we want to kind of touch a little bit on education in Ireland and how we can all do better I suppose for people that are less privileged than ourselves. So uh, would you maybe like to give me a little synopsis about your career to date and we can, uh, I know you're retired now, a few years. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a native of Tipperary, a little place called Banshe in West Tipperary and uh, I joined the prison service in 1968 and uh, not by not, not any vocation or anything like that. I just happened to join. And I mean, I worked for three years in Limerick. I was assigned to Limerick, which is a small um, a local prison at the time. And numbers in prison were very low. 600 people in prison, 660 at the time. 260 of those were boys between the ages of 16 and 21. So there's only 400 adults. Yeah. Three prisons. Different world. It was over 50 years ago. Um, Ireland and the world was a different place. Um um, so I, you know, so I spent three years there, and it was a great education. Um, so one of the things I have often reflected on afterwards was that, and I believe this applies to most people, is that um, our perceptions and beliefs are generally wrong, and uh, often very wrong. And I, my perception of you know who was going to I was going to find in prison or I was going to meet in prison was certainly you know very very narrow. Um, and very conservative and based on, I suppose, my lack of knowledge and, in, and insight. And it was my philosophy and my beliefs were that you know, all the bad people are in prison and all the good people are outside. And I wasn't there a week, really, when I realized that that's not true. And what I met, I met in Limerick at that time were mostly social misfits and misfortunes with the odd criminal uh, thrown in. Yes. And, um, so it was, that was very obvious, actually, uh, even to somebody as young as I was. I was only 20 at the time with no life experience. And um, so anyway, it was on that basis and uh, that I began to look at and realize that life, like, I mean, I decided way back then that life ain't fair. And some lovely people ended up in prison um, as a result of terrible circumstances, social circumstances, um, and often just one bad choice, one bad decision, led them on to hundreds of bad decisions. And... Um, and that's it really, isn't it? And I see that as well in pharmacy and I've certainly noticed that over my career when we see someone who has dependency issues with heroin, etc. And they might be abusing it for, for years and we, we get them through in, onto the methadone program, we see them. And really, it's you're a victim of the, the family you're born into, the social class, if we can say that word, you're born into, the area that you're born into, the, the country that you're born into. And, you know, but for the grace of God, go I, I think we should all kind of look at ourselves and kind of ask ourselves, you know, how we can kind of, I suppose, make it easier and better for people that do end up in the system, in the prison system or in that kind of, you know, a, a lifestyle. Um, how can we socially come together to make it better for them? Yeah, I mean, it's very complex now and there's no easy solution to it and people, you know, with the best of intentions just don't understand. And uh, I mean, I gave a long time uh, in my during my uh, life, working life in prison, trying to communicate that, not very successfully, but I, I did try to try to communicate to the public and to give them a better insight into the causes of and the circumstances of and what leads people into criminality. I still go back to the basic that people make choices, irrespective of 
where you are or what you are, you, you make choices. And uh, you, it, a lot of the downfall of people comes from making what I would consider bad choices. But my t definition of a bad choice may not be their definition of a bad choice. Yeah. And that's one of the things I learned, that you can have all the best wishes in the world and the best ideas and, and, and be highly motivated. But unless you stop and connect with the per individual person and listen to his or her story, which is always, you know, something very, very different from what what the public would see and believe yeah. you have no chance of trying to help that person you can't force change on people real change i believe yeah. but what you can do is you can uh, nurture it you can encourage it and you can often help people uh, to change but the first step is to to to, to understand their reality and culture um even local culture is powerful plus or minus. And in the vast numbers of people who end up in prison, the, the culture is very negative and destructive. Um, what people often don't understand is self-esteem, confidence is hugely important. The two things I learned, and I only learned it in the latter years, uh, that I, for me now, the two most important things, believe it or not, is around self-confidence and self-belief, self-worth, all that I believe in myself. Yeah. And some cultures give you that. And I used to say way back, Laura, way back 30, 40 years ago, the best place in the old days, not any longer, but in the old days, if you wanted to get a public example and highlight that particular culture thing, the difference in culture, go to the local church and look at where people sat in the church, especially in the country. The more confident they were, the more affluent they were, the more they believed in themselves, the higher up the church they went, okay. up to the very front. And the lower you are, yeah. that's where you ended up, at the back. And people at the back wouldn't be wouldn't go up to the front if you brought them with you know if you pushed them with a JCB yeah. because their confidence was so low. Uh, that was one self confidence, and the second one, believe it or not, was vocabulary. Yes, well, I didn't realize that until I nearly retired from the prison service and I did a little project in Belfast with uh, with eight young children, uh, teenagers who came from very deprived backgrounds, and I, I I began to realize very quickly that some of them their vocabulary was so limited that the only words they could use were foul words, and everything was fuck off everything. Yeah. And you'd be saying, well, even when you, when I, I remember one day praising one of the girls and saying, "You are brilliant," and her response was, "Fuck off, John." Yeah. Said, wow. They if can't you, express themselves. That's they don't I mean, the lack of vocabulary. But you take then an employer or a teacher or somebody who's at the, at the recipient of that and you're told to fuck off. Your immediate reaction is to, to react to it in a yeah. very, you know, uh, overpowering way, in a disciplinary way and all that. And the person who's uttering those words does Takes no, doesn't even understand. Doesn't understand the impact of them yeah, because they because, hear them all the time. Or yeah, they're it's, using it's them all fundamentally the time. back then to basic education. Yeah. And not academic education because again, we get completely hung up on while academic education is, in, of course, is important. But again, we focus on, and even in prison, they were focusing on us on the leave and certain are absolute rubbish because the people we were working with were a million miles away from the leave and Yeah. And what you wanted was basic uh, living education and, and basic uh, knowledge and insights into uh, how the world operates, how you uh, into people interact, uh, what, how important it is to be able to communicate, yeah. uh, or uh, confidence because confidence comes from education and all, they're all linked together. Um, so I came to the conclusion, well, a long time ago now, that the only real long-term solution, meaningful solution to poverty is education. Yeah. The challenge, of course, is how do you get people who are disconnected from the mainstream of education, how do you get them to stay in education? And that was the, you know, um, that was my belief 25, 30 years ago, and it is still my belief. But the challenge is how do you connect with them? How do you motivate them? And how do you reward them? Because in many cases, the, 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 again, because we are very linked to social status, if you have an address in certain areas, Mount Joy, six small, tiny little areas, uh, contributes to 75% of all Dublin born, uh, born prisoners. Yeah. Um, they were all the most socially deprived areas in Dublin city. Now, in, in those areas, um, if you gave that area uh, 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 an address for it, it's going for it, looking for a job, there is no way you'd be accepted. Uh, a matter of fact, it's sort of funny at the moment, in, uh, funny uh, in, in this sense, that in 2002, uh, you know, people, employers now, because they're stuck, are even looking at people with criminal records, not alone in Ireland, but in other countries as well. And that's a, just a funny 
change because again of need. They can't get other workers, but when they had choice, the yeah. last people would you'd get it would give, they'd give a job to somebody with a criminal record or with an address from these particular areas. And then all the sort of baggage they have with vocabulary and behavior and all those sort of things and low self-esteem and, and no self-confidence all contributes to the being rejected. And of course, the more you're rejected as a human being, the you know, the more it just you perpetuates feel, that feeling. And the more of, you're ostracized and yeah. disconnected. And that's what I used to keep saying. If you're disconnected from society, you're a very big danger to society. Because yeah. if you're not, you have no connection, you don't care. And uh, quite a number of people I met didn't care. And so for me, going to prison and, and getting a criminal record, and for the vast numbers of people, would be horrific. You'd be but mortified, them, yeah. yeah. But for them, didn't mean much. Matter of fact, credit, uh, if you could, Laura, uh, for some of them, it was a sort of a badge of honour. Okay. Uh, that they were sort of, I'm, I'm, you know, it, it was funny to watch young lads going to St. Patrick's when it was open, uh, 16 to 21 year olds, and eventually graduating to Mount Joy. And when they came to Mount Joy first, they were always pushed out to the bottom. Yeah. Because the older prisoners didn't wear them, they were too much energy, they were too too many messers. Yeah. They had to go back down to the st to the bottom and start to build their careers again, which is fascinating. But their ambition was to get up there to the top, uh, and so that's what you're trying to counteract the booze of that, the whole uh, the status they have with, with, within their own communities because they are a good criminals. So you have to understand that and say, right, these are the challenges, and then how do we help them to change that? But just condemning them and ostracizing them and punishing them, which is when we have an obsession, which I know. I, I mean, I'm fascinated with punishment. Yeah. In the sense that the more it fails, the more we increase it. So you say, right, if you get, you know, I'll send you to prison for six months. But if you're back again, I'll send you for 12 months. If you're back again, I'll send you for two years. I say, well, what's the logic? I mean, the six months didn't work. The 12 months didn't work. The two years didn't work. But we just keep going straight ahead. We don't down into the cul-de-sac and we just keep blindly doing. lives doing. lost then. Yeah, and, um, and, and yeah. costing a fortune. Yeah. And not alone that, but ensuring that the next generation, which I came across myself, three generations in my time of the same families doing the same thing. Now, if that's not demoralizing and if that's not an indication of a failed system, well, there's nothing. You yeah. know, if you keep failing, um, you you must stop at some stage and say, hold on, it's not working. How can we, do, is there some different way we can do it? Or is there a different strategy? Because the, this, this strategy of punishment certainly isn't isn't working. And and if you, ha if you were able to change something or this system that you, that is that that we do have, which, you know, the system is built for people in power, and the people in power are the people that are elevated in society as well. How do we go about the change? Because, like you said, with, with education, you know, you have student A from us from one of those, what just say student A from one of those deprived areas in Dublin uh, that works just as hard as student B, who's not from a deprived area, but student B, they both work as hard as each other, but student B gets grind school, gets to go to the Gale talked, gets, you know, is surrounded by parents that read books that, you know, encourage education, uh, that give them the self-confidence that they need. Like, who is going to thrive? So our education system, our CAO point system, everything is geared towards the middle class, people that are already affluent, already born into privilege. And therefore, the people that are from the deprived areas just get pushed down, pushed down, pushed down. How do we change it? Because it's it just it actually seems to be getting worse. Like the disparity. Like when I was in in pharmacy school, there was one person that I know in my going through in my five years of of pharmacy school that was from a really unprivileged background, really desperate background. And the reason they got in was because they were highly highly intelligent, far more intelligent than I was. But they got in because their their teachers saw what they could give. They may have have not got the points that say that the likes of the rest of us have got, but they, they could have like bought and sold us if they'd got the the steerage that we had had. And they're doing very well now. But that was one person in my five years. How do you think, what would you do if you were able to change the system in one one small way even? Yeah, well, it, again, as I said at the beginning, Laura, it's a very difficult, complex issue and there's no simple solution and there's no instant solution. Um, and that's probably one of the greatest challenges, again, and difficulties we have with our political system. And it's not a unique to Ireland. It's in, in, in all democracies, generally, politics is all about today. It's about delivery. It's about being re-elected. It's about popularity uh, and all that sort of stuff. And so there's there's uh, very few people prepared to, to, to plan on the long term because you're talking about a 
50 to 60, 70 year period. But, uh, if you want to change the culture and, you know, and it's about education and it's about going into the people in their communities, accepting them as they are at the level they are and then working with them gradually to engage them, to motivate them and to facilitate their growth and development through education. That, in my view, is the long term and only solution. Yeah. It's a very difficult one in the sense that you have to understand, and 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 some some people do. The vast numbers don't. That in their own communities, where the vast numbers of these young people grow up, they are not encouraged. They are actually discouraged. So, if somebody has a an ambition to be a pharmacist, the vast numbers of people, including their own parents, will tell them from a very young age, "You cop on. You'll never be nothing. You will yeah. never be a pharmacist. You'll never be a doctor. You'll never be a barrister. You'll never be nothing." And as a result of that, instead of being encouraged, Encouraging and building up their confidence, uh, they're actually discouraging young other teenagers, seventy, well, younger even, twelve and 13, 14 year olds who have dropped out of education, for instance, in these areas. These are going to be huge influences on the next ten and eleven year olds, and so you're trying to break that cycle. You're trying to break that status. So it is, it's and another element that I was I often trying to explain about is that it's it's um you know if you're a young boy especially because boys are re are really at risk now it's 97 percent of the prison population in Ireland are made up of men so it's pre criminality is predominantly a male thing and that's not saying that that women don't have and young women and young girls in these areas don't have difficulties they do but the vast numbers don't end up in prison towards no. the vast numbers of young guys from these areas end up with criminal records and eventually prison and the, the, the sort of fascinating thing about it is that in many ways is that their status and their, you know, everything about them is is built on this. And they become very positive role models in, in a very destructive way. Yeah. So young lads are looking at them as being, so they're uh, into drugs and they're dealing drugs, but they're driving around in a very posh car. Well, the young lad is saying, wow, look at him. He's successful, but he's successful in criminality. Yeah. So... It's so, so I go back to, I'm absolutely convinced that the only long-term solution to eradicate social deprivation and poverty, because it is poverty in, in, in a, and I suppose it's just to say that as well, uh, Laura, again, our, our, the vast numbers of people just, oh, if we mention the word poverty, they look at materialistic stuff. Yes. They look at food and they look at clothes and they look at housing and all this materialistic stuff. But poverty has really massive other dimensions to it as well and other consequences way more serious than the materialistic side yeah. in, in the areas that I, I, I mentioned. And uh, so if you're born into those areas, the, 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 the powerful, negative, destructive culture is way more powerful. I, I, I was just making the point as well. If a young guy at 14 or 15 has a gun, for instance, uh, has access to a gun and he's walking around his community, which some of them are, with a gun, now you can imagine the buzz that that fella has and the power he has. Yeah. Get out of my way. And you jump out of his way because he has a gun. Yeah. Um, or he has contacts who have guns. So he, he has this status and this power and this buzz. So there's no education system in the world that can give you the same buzz as that. I know it's a destructive buzz, but again, until we understand that young boys are going to be greatly influenced by this, that uh, this becomes almost a life ambition to become one of the gangland lords and leaders um, and have people working for you and all this. Stuff. It's sort of an industry, a yeah. criminal industry, but it is an industry. So you can imagine how difficult it is to break down that uh, layer by layer to get them to realize that, you know, life is, is, is has a different, uh, you know, has other purposes and you can lead uh, what would you could say, generally speaking, a law-abiding life. Well, no, that's very complex as well and, <laughs> and debatable. But in the, in the top of the criminality we are talking about. And then, of course, as you know from your, your professional experience, uh, in, when I started off in 1968, uh, the only drug that was there was alcohol. And cigarettes, if you if you include cigarettes, because everybody in prison smoked, by the way, and I think they still do. Uh, and and alcohol was the other. It's like a stress relief, though. It's yeah, just you it's, know, it's a cultural thing as well. Yeah. And yes. it's an educational thing. So yeah. there's a, there's a, again, there's a lot of us. Yeah, and mental hospitals and prisons are the two highest areas of smokers. So 
why is that? And and it is got to do with a lot of those issues and others as well. But uh, in in terms of nowadays, I then I suppose for me, um, you said to me, what's the worst thing that happened? The most destructive thing, the most damaging thing that happened to Irish society and in prison culture over that fifty years uh, when from when I started, I have no hesitation in saying drugs and particularly heroin. heroin. That was the scourge of introduced into the poor areas of Dublin way back in the seventies. Introduced itself into Mount Joy in the early 80s and eventually dominated uh, Mount Joy when I was there. Uh, why? Because all the people coming into Mount Joy came from those six areas where were they, they were all infested with, with uh, um, heroin, deliberately planted there because the poor people were very open and it was fertile uh, ground and fertile areas for the, the, the drug suppliers and pushers to, to exploit poverty. And uh, people took drugs to to get away from their reality. They're self-medicating. But they got away to, yeah. to get away from their reality yeah. and they were stoned yeah. out of their minds and they, then they had to deal with reality and that's what really it was. Yeah. And then it became to become, now and now in the last 20 years it has, uh, as, as you know, been, you know, increased dramatically. The whole thing has been exacerbated through violence and gangland feuds and control uh, of areas and all that sort of stuff with horrific consequences. Um, so that's a new, uh, laterally, you know, relatively new in terms of historically, a new dimension to it that is, is really, really destructive. And it makes the job then, even in the prison, um, a lot more difficult because if you're, you know, you're going nowhere while you're addicted until you deal with your addiction, acknowledge your addiction, which is the first major step. And denial would be one of the biggest single issues in prison. And I mean, I met hundreds and hundreds of young men that I spoke to and listened to around their addiction. And the vast numbers of them felt they had no addiction okay. and that they could give it up when they were rubbish, pure rubbish. But that's, and I always believe this, that unless and until you bring the person along to the stage where he or she acknowledges and accepts, I have a problem, you ain't going anywhere. And that is a huge challenge as well, to bring him down to that stage. And that's only the first stage. And then the second stage, of course, is to try to motivate him to do something about their addiction, which is another, another ma major challenge. So, and while you're addicted, you ain't going anywhere in terms of education or in terms of progress or holding down a job or doing anything. So yeah. you can see that it's a very difficult uh, And even challenging. even getting them onto an addiction program, like a methadone program, you know, that's one step. But keeping them on it is another. And then, you know, when just say, like I, I know from, from myself, you get someone onto your program or you, they need to actually remove themselves from the area from which they're in because they just see it all day, every day. So they may go into a rehab centre if they're lucky and detox completely, but they come back out and the first thing that happens is there's a knock on their door and an offer of free drugs as well. And it's just, it creates that permanent cycle. It's very, very difficult to get yeah, off and, and stay off it. Yeah, which is another fascination, our uh, fascinating thing that your listeners wouldn't uh, properly understand or appreciate very much either. And that is, again, the, 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 the cultures. Um, if you go to prison with an addiction, if you go to prison, which the vast numbers do with very poor educational att attainment behind you, for instance, 6%, only 6% of guys in Mount Jai stayed at school after 16. Now, that's a phenomenal, depressing figure if you think about it. 94% of men in Mount Jai had left our education system by the age of 16 with no qualifications, at June yeah. or, or, or um, uh, uh, leave and stuff. But the culture in the prison you might imagine would be, and, and you know, people you said to me, but you have a captured audience and therefore, you know, they, you should, they should have to go to school. Or they should have to do something about their addiction. But would you believe that the, the, the main trust of, their, of the culture is to discourage? So the prisoners are saying to one another, why are you going to school? Who do you think you are? Why are you going for addiction counselling? Why are you going for treatment? Stay with us. You know, you're too big for your boots now. Okay. So they are actually disencouraging. Now, that's hard to believe. So when someone goes to prison who is educated, the first place they'll go is straight to the education unit. That amazing? Yeah. And they'll go on to study maybe through open university or something, a further course, because they understand and appreciate education. If you go into prison illiterate, it's almost certain you'll come out illiterate because you won't go next nine or near any of the educational services as part of that culture, low motivation, all that. It's it's an, un, an unbelievable dynamic that's there. So it's and it represents the dynamic outside. And yeah. people keep I keep saying to them, you know, 
The gangland feud starts on the outside. The drug addiction starts on the outside, by yeah. and large. Because by in case yeah. somebody would, you know, and listeners are going to say, well, I know somebody went to prison drug-free and came out addicted because I used to listen to that rubbish. And, you know, it was frustrating because I... You know, I said, maybe that happened once or twice, but 99% of guys who came into Mount Joy came in with drugs, uh, you know, using drugs, and they just continued on. They made a child. And I have always said as well, by the way, that if somebody did happen to take, you know, decide to go on drugs in the prison, that was a personal choice. The same as they made the choice outside. And and this idea that somebody forces them in Mount Joy to use drugs. If I, I know a lot of men and, and women that went to prison for various crimes, hadn't an addiction, never touched drugs while they were in prison because they made a choice not to. Yeah. So you have you, you I still come back to this thing that you have to acknowledge that it is a personal choice. And until we accept that, uh, we'll then we're not going anywhere because prison will not be able to deter fellows from using drugs no. in the story. You're just you're, you're, and, and the system itself, and I admit even prison governors, and they tell blatant lies to the public. You know, no drugs here, and oh, yeah, absolute blatant lies. Like, I mean, well, that was one of the things I decided to do from day one was, was simply tell the truth yeah. and be honest and say, you know, we have drugs and we have a serious drug addiction problem because we most of our committals are drug addic addicts coming in the, the gates, and until we tackle those and work in cohesion with the communities, uh, which by the way we were beginning to do, and I'm sure it is better now, but towards the last few years of my, my time in Mount Joy when I retired in 2010 but from about six, uh, 2005 or six onwards we were linking up much better with the communities looking you know in the aftercare and connecting guys back into clinics on the outside and into support services and all that sort of thing and that was certainly a step rather than opening the gates and just throwing Letting them out them the gates yeah with no no connections and what what's it like now like, like is the prison service uh, better than it was when you left it or is it the same or has it regressed is it fit for purpose well, I'm sure a lot I'll of ask people. you 10 questions there uh, in one you know, <laughs> I, I'm sure Lauren a lot of people say it has to be better after I leaving but, uh, but I suppose my analysis of it would be that that uh, when I started off in 1950 or 1968 um, medical services were appallingly inadequate there were no no psychiatric services none uh, even though one in four prisoners have a history of being an inpatient in psychiatric hospitals, so there's a connection between psychiatric illness and criminality. There was no psychologist. There was no probation officers. Um, so the food was horrible. So, so what happened in the interim in the last 50 years? Um, excellent medical services. Absolutely excellent. Excellent psychiatric services, except inpatient hospital facilities, which are still very, very inadequate. So uh, we have excellent in-house psychiatric s services, but very, very short, again, on in bed. Uh, in other words, what prisoners need in-hospital treatment. Uh, in, in the old central mental hospital, uh, the, the beds were not there. Uh, psychological services are much better. They're not probably totally adequate, but they're much better. Very good probation service in the prisons again uh, nowadays. So... Um, the physical conditions in so far as uh, the cells and the buildings, the vast numbers of prisons now and the vast uh, number of areas in prisons are way, way superior to when I started. So there has been a lot of progress. Yes. Backwards, what went backwards, uh, the worst thing that happened in terms of, I suppose, undermining the 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 the, the the basic private uh, and personal uh, structures that were in place for over a hundred years uh, of single cell occupancy, which is hugely significant as far as I'm concerned, uh, that has been demolished and 50% of prisoners today have to share cells. And, and is that because there's much, much many more people, there's a much higher prison population? Too many prisoners for the number of, of single cells. And then expediency comes in, political experience, expediency, yeah. and Alan Shatter uh, made a statement when he was cutting the sod in Cork that, uh, this is what he said, and I can quote him, because he said, ideally, it, we should have single cell occup occupancy, but we can't afford it at the moment. So as a result of that, we're going to build them on the basis of double and triple cells. And But people have no Even idea. Even for people's own self, oh. sense of self, having that space to yourself. Wow, yeah. uh, Laura, people just don't appreciate it. We all need space. Yeah. We all need to walk the park. We all need to go into the room on our own sometimes. we just human beings. Now, yeah. the one thing you don't want is somebody stuck in your face 24-7. Now, if you're sharing a cell with somebody, you are actually face to face with somebody 24-7. Now you can imagine the stress of that, the pressure of that. 
even if he's a, a normal person, and I'd say that in inverted commas, yeah. if he's normal, but imagine, suppose he's a bit of a, you know, he has a psychiatric problem yeah. or, or if he's a talking problem. Just imagine he never shut up. Sure, he'd drive you crazy like. Yeah. And you, there's nothing you can do. And by the way, the other part of the thing that most people wouldn't know, one thing you're not do, allowed to do in prison by the prison culture, by the prisoners in the prison culture, is to complain or to report anything. That is their control thing. You don't report, you just put up with it. And So, so the within the cells, the inmates themselves, Even that's if you're being that's bullied, you're, yeah, yeah, okay. well, oh yeah, absolutely. But you know why that is. That's, yeah. that's what gives them control. Gosh. And uh, so therefore, if you're being a victim of bullying, for instance, sexual abuse, which I believe doubling up facilitates, and, uh, and drug abuse, you, you can't go down and go into the governor and say, by the way, I, I, I want to move because John Lonergan is, is, is harassing me or bullying me. That's, you're gone. You're a grass. You're a rat. That's it. Your, your status is gone in the prison. Uh, so they'll tolerate, you know, anything rather than to report it. So uh, doubling up, not alone mentally and emotionally and psychologically, but it also uh, facilitates abuses like, like yes. bullying, sexual abuse and drug abuse. Um, so that's the most backward thing. Um, and, and the thing that hasn't changed as well is that the, the communities are still made up predominantly from the same backgrounds as they were 50, 60, 70 years ago. And that is certainly depressing. So you still have these young men, and they're young men, by the way, which is another very important point to make to people, is that predominantly the prison population is made up of young males. Young males, the average in Mount age in Mount Joy when I was there was 27, but two thirds were under 27. That so that'll give you an idea awful. that they're all young men. And the, the biggest cha factor that changed, uh, most men drop out of prison in their early, mid-30s. And that's a fact. They drop, you hear a lot about recidivism and again, all that sort of stuff. But the reality is the vast numbers of men drop out of prison from their uh, early to mid-30s onwards. And very few are in prison after that. And the reason for that is, there, well, there are many reasons, uh, but the biggest single one is maturity. They, they mature, they cop on. They realise that prison is a disaster. Imagine it takes them to, like, literally half their life almost. You know, well, like, well, if they're going to live to, you know, or... To say, Laura, the, the best years of yeah. their lives because their late teens and 20s and early 30s are spent in prison. In and out, in and out, in and out. And, uh, there you must know, be such the, a sense of regret. Ex well, that, that's exactly what happens to them when they, uh, are, are, they have children of their own. Yeah. And that is another real eye-opener for them when their seven and eight-year-old starts switching school and the, the, the father is in prison, of course. He's such, such a reliable role model, positive yeah. role model. He's in prison, but now he's concerned about the child. And he said, well, I, you're not going down the same road as me yeah. because my life has been a disaster. I don't want... But he's in prison, so like he's, the, you know, he's in no position to help the child. But he uh, does certainly influence, and they get tired of prison. People say, you know, prison is this and prison is that. Listen, I can vouch for this. Prison breaks down the toughest of men. Okay. Don't get over there. Prison breaks down the toughest of men. You're locked up 17, 18, 19, 20 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks in the year for 10 years. You can imagine the mark that that leaves on you. No decision making, no normal balanced communities, you know, all men spending huge amount of times locked up and all that macho rubbish that men go on with, as yeah. you can appreciate, you know, tough. There is, you know, I met very few tough men in prison. But they thought they were tough or they pretended they were tough. And I always say to young lads when I'm in school talking to young men again in school, you know, that's, you know, because young lads that think they're tough, even in middle class areas, you know, sort of shapes going around. And I always say to them, listen, I never met a tough man yet that didn't meet his match. He either yeah. met somebody that was tougher than him or he met somebody that was tougher and madder than he was. <laughs> and, and, and by yeah. the way, I did. And every single one of them. You know, the, the hardened criminal's life is a, sh is a short life. They either die from misadventure or drug overdosing or shot or killed or killed in accident. People don't realise the number of people, young people, that that's tragically, uh, you know, their lives are ended as well. So criminality, there's no winners in criminality. I've always said this as well. There's no winners. The, the, the victims are destroyed for life. Sometimes their lives are absolutely wrecked. Uh, sometimes people are killed or badly injured or traumatised. 
the, the, the perpetrator, he's going to spend a huge amount of his life in prison and his family are wrecked and all his children are, <laughs> if he has children, are, are left, uh, you know, isolated and orphaned, as you could say. So um, society is paying a big price to keep them in prison because it's cost millions to keep people, you know, prison system going 300, 350, uh, 300, maybe million or 400 million nowadays. A lot of money. And, yeah. and that's only the prisons and then you have the courts and the guards and all the other structures. So crime is cost a fortune and there are no winners everyone is losers yeah and that revolving door of people that go come into prison and back out again and come into prison can you like have you seen people reform themselves like what kind of percentage of people would you say if you could even put a number on it or a figure come in and they may have come in one or two times or however many times they do but they do leave like like, like what you said in their 30s mid 30s and they actually go on to live fulfilling happy if someone can say like happy lives content lives is there is there an is there a minority often that do a majority is, is it a half and half well, you know it, you'd like to think that once they've served their time yeah yeah it's again it's it's um it's not straightforward because a huge number of people go to prison once and never come back and uh but the the, the you know the thing the strange thing about that or the funny thing about that is that they're generally not from that catchment group that I okay. talked about so you're sort of Typical Mount Joy prisoner that I was there. The vast numbers of them came in in their teens into St. Pat's, graduated eventually down to Mount Joy as adults and <coughs> remained in the prison system and the criminal system right up to their mid-30s. And they did a lot of that, in and out and in and out. And as you mentioned already, Laura, a lot of that is down to the, you know, a whole lot of other factors, like when they go out, where do they go? They go back to it where all the, 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 the you know, all the, the contributory factors just to criminality, you know, the, the causes of their criminality are all in front of their noses, drugs, peer pressure, idleness, poverty, uh, all, uh, you know, all those factors are still there. And when they go back out, uh, you know, and even if they're on drugs, what I found when, when in Mount Joy, roughly a rough rule of thumb was that about 50% of prisoners who were heroin users and drug users on the outside absolutely abstain from drugs in prison. Deliberately, not, they didn't deal with their addiction. And, that, and it's very important to make that point. And you understand that point, but a lot of your listeners and viewers won't understand this point. But there is one thing, abstaining from drugs or abstaining from alcohol. But that is not dealing with your alcoholism or dealing with your addiction uh, or the causes of it. Or they are just simply abstaining uh, deliberately to get their bodies together again, as they said, or my head together, a lot of them would say, and their heads together. They, they get better food. You know, prison does a lot of positive things for people who live that sort of a rough life. They have structure. They go to bed a lot. They get good food. They get medical care. Is the food good? The nutrition yeah. value well, of yeah. it is good. It's I not like I, slop I, or... No, it's not. But, but uh, you see, the, another contradiction. You know, I would say, and, and you would say, if you went in and saw the food and the uh, the quality of it, uh, and and, all, and and the way it's done and all, you would say this is this is as good as a hotel, and it is in okay. terms of the quality of the food. But you ask most of the prisoners, do you like the food in prison? They say shit. And okay. did, why? Because we get, you know, we did. We get dietitians in, and they're regularly going in looking at the food, and and, and you have to have colours on your plate. What? Uh, that means vegetables. What are they? <laughs> so. Carrots are there, or Brussels, whatever they are, are uh, you know, uh, different vegetables. Most of them will never eat a vegetable because they never eat vegetables on the outside. And, and this goes back to culture. education and culture. culture. So You've generations if, of people that have never cooked a home meal. Absolutely, Laura. And if you gave them fish and chips and chicken and chips seven days a week, three times a day, they'd say brilliant food. Okay. The decisions say you're absolutely wrecking their lives. Uh, you're giving them all the wrong food. So you can see again, back to education again. And uh, uh, I remember I did a little program um, uh, called John Lonergan Circus um, <laughs> way back uh, uh, after leaving in around 2013 with Independent Pictures. And we took these eight, uh, about two, four boys and four girls up to Belfast two days a week for 13 weeks to, to introduce them to Street Circus. But one particular young girl of 14 years of age at the time uh, what was noticeable the very first day we went there is that she wasn't eating anything except Coke and chocolate 
and crisps. And the guy who was, he's dead since, the guy, Will, who was in charge of the Belfast Circus, he decided, he said, wow. And uh, so he put on food and of course they wouldn't eat it. Uh, but she particularly wouldn't eat. So he brought in a very well-known chef from Belfast and he said, listen, sit down with them, talk to them and come up with meals that they'll eat and then at least we'll be giving them a, a decent meal in the middle of the day. And this top-class chef came in, he sat down with them, he cooked everything and anything that they had said and she still didn't eat. But the, the, the producer, Anna Rogers was her name, Anna sort of took an interest in this young woman and she just kept working away with her. And and after the 13 weeks, one of our major achievements that didn't make the cameras at all as such was that our last night in Belfast, we said we'd go out for a meal. We went out for a meal and she did eat some food that was served that night for the first time ever. And that just highlights that what is education. It's it's changing the culture. It's you know, but it's a slow process. Like yes. where would you get someone to stay with someone for thirty? We wouldn't have done it only for the, that was the program. Yeah. But it just took that length of time for the person to begin to realize. Well, wow, this food isn't as bad as I thought, and I can eat some food that is normal, what we would call normal food. Yeah. But it just highlights. Uh, like so, I was making the point that like prison put you know you have to go to bed early. Like they, they, these guys. They, they they stay up all night and sleep all day. So they have the wrong way around. Uh, you know, you see them, the, the white face. Sure, no wonder, because they're never out in the daylight, but they're out at night. There's no structure. Uh, they don't get medical care either, by the way, and they don't look after themselves, but they get it in prison. And it's, a, it's an amazing thing. They regard it as their right to get medical care in prison, and they're right for that, by yeah. the way. But And they tell you, I have a right to it. Of course, outside, if they go in somewhere and say, I have a right to something, you're told, get lost. Yeah. So, but, so prison does, uh, has a, a positive contribution to make in some ways, but it certainly puts a bit. And so drug addiction, people, 50% will go into prison and come out, uh, you know, f healthier, but on ways, look better, but they haven't even del even taken any notice of or addressed their addiction in the mi most minor way. And of course, you're dead right. Within hours of release, where are they? Back on drugs again. And yeah. that's why they're at such high risk of overdosing. And the levels of overdosing that happens as a result within a week or less than a week of, of leaving prison is huge. The figures are huge. Huge and yeah. depressing. And they're told, by the way, it's not that they're not told. They're warned and told by the medical people and the drug counsellors and all that in the prison that this is your most vulnerable time when you get out because your tolerance is zero and of course they can if they go back and take the same amount of heroin that they were taking before oh, they went sure. to prison should they have no chance yeah. because their tolerance is gone um, so you can see that uh, but I, I was just making the point about, about addiction now some of them do address their addiction and I have seen hundreds of people over the years who dealt with their addiction never went back to prison and are living normal lives and I know some of them and they're doing exceptionally well and I be actually sort of it's sort of um, amazing and and sort of fulfilling I meet hundreds of guys on the streets of Cork and Limerick and Dublin that have been in prison and and most of them haven't been in prison for some of them would say I've been in prison you know, for 25 years okay. and, and one of the funny things as well are is that they're always disappointed I don't know them because I don't know them of course and they, you know they say do you know me and I'd say no well you should and I'd say, I'd say why should I know you because I was in trouble and I was oh, in no yeah. and uh, you know are you sending me this are you this uh, but the point I'm making is that, that you know I was in Cork a few about two years ago before COVID and I was walking down Patrick Street and these three guys uh, passed me on the street and uh, and I was just gone past it one of them shouted back it's a larrigan and I, I went back I said yeah and then they started chatting and, and two of them had completed 14 years of a prison sentence in Mount Jaw and I was chatting to them anyway and they looked great and uh, they were up to, uh, all drugs gone and they looked real healthy and full of energy and, 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 and I said what are you out of them they said oh, I've been back now for years and all that and they Actually, we're on our way to, to distribute penny dinners. And here's okay. the three of them hitting off, absolutely full of energy. Yeah. And so they had turned the corner, but they were in their They're 40s. in the minority. They were in their 40s yeah. now. You know, what had they done for their late teens and 20s and 30s? They spent it in prison. Yeah. So that is, the, I suppose, the, the depressing side is that they have wasted so much time. But the positive side is at least they have now dealt with it and they're at least living normal lives now, our report would cry. But the, it is a struggle, Laura, for them, in fairness to them. Like, and we have to acknowledge this. We well, always said to them, I always made this point that we have an obligation as a society to give people choices. 
You have you can stay in criminality if you want, but these are the consequences. You'll spend a lot of your time in prison. But if you want to give it up, these are choices for you. And in a lot of cases, I'm afraid, most of them don't have choices. Yeah, and that that is the issue. And nowadays, actually, crack cocaine is a huge addiction issue in certain areas of Dublin too. And particularly, it's, well, it's very bad for everyone, but women that succumb to crack addiction fall into all kinds of difficulties in terms of like prostitution, and everything that goes with that too. So there's it, it's popping up very much as, as a serious problem. Would you have had much to do with the DOCA Centre when you were in Mount Joy? Or would you have, have any, you know, I, I know that there, it's only a very small percentage of people of the, in the criminal justice system that actually are females, but how do they, how does it differ for them than Mount Joy? Yeah, well, gosh, uh, yeah, I was uh, a responsibility for the DOCA and I uh, was involved in its development and... Uh, I suppose it's one again, gee, we wouldn't have many what I consider success stories in my time. And uh, but I, I would say Dorcas was certainly uh, a, a success story in, in terms of, first of all, the design of it. And uh, and secondly, the, the, the regime that we uh, sort of developed in the in the Dorcas was certainly different, unique. And in my view, up there with the best in the world when I, when I was there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it came about actually because I, my first day, when Mountjoy in 1984 on the 2nd of June 1984 I was appointed governor of Mountjoy and I went up to the women's prison because we the, the two prisons were under the governor of Mountjoy and it was an old prison built in 1854 uh, 1858 and um, it was built like a prison like a prison for men even though it was for women and then at that stage, in, from 1956 onwards the, the boys of St. Patrick's had been uh, occupying uh, uh, three quarters of the building and looking down on top of the women who are in one little wing and the basement of a wing and for the horrif horrendous place. Yeah. Uh, and I, I honestly, I said coming out the gate after that first visit, if I do nothing else, I, I, I'm going to do something about women in prison because I honestly, I have to, I always be guilty of this. And nowadays you'd be eaten alive for saying this, but I did always have a sort of a soft spot for women in prison. I just couldn't ever, I don't know, it is going back probably to you know, your mother and all that sort of thing, but to see women locked up and most of them having children and mothers and all that, I just found that really, really tough. And especially when the conditions were so bad because yeah. they were way worse than for the women and the men at that time okay. uh, because they were and, and they were overlooked by the boys and you could imagine the boys oh, slagged at them goodness. and shouted at them day and night. And uh, out of that came the Dawkins. And the Dawkins was designed in a completely, with a completely different philosophy which was, was uh, you know, to build it as a community which we did and to in integrate the women into the community and to work with them as a community. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was particularly, I think, it, it gave them some privacy, like they had a, a key to their own rooms. They were all single room occupancy, which was built. And are they still now? They indeed, they're not. They're, okay. they, uh, that was another part of the skullduggery and the this, this sabotage. Uh, we put showers in on and everyone was saying, oh my God, you know, but a shower like. I mean, for me, a shower has two values. It has a hygiene and it has a psychological mental. And if you're down in the dumps or if you're not feeling well and you jump in the shower for a half an hour or 20 minutes or 10 minutes even and get a shower, 99% of people come out of the shower feeling better uh, psychologically and mentally and physically. And so, that's so simple. Like, uh, you yeah, do it yourself. Yeah. You feel better Absolutely. after the shower. About, we use the word deliberately normalizing. Yeah. We're trying to normalize the community because... People, again, didn't think, like you put men into prison and you lock them up 20, 20 22 hours a day and you, you do everything for them. You give them no responsibility, nothing. Then you open the gate after three years and you say, out you go. And you now think that person is going to go out and you re function. Re function. Exactly, that's the word. Functioning. He can function. He's, in, he's been totally institutionalized. So we were trying to do that with the women. <coughs> But again, Laura, the vast, vast numbers of women that ended up in, in the Dorcas uh, uh, were, again, from the same background, with the same baggage as the Bain. Uh, you know, but with the added with the added uh, 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 problem of most of them being mothers. And I suppose one other and thing... Would they be coming in pregnant? Would they be... Absolutely, yeah. And, and what happens to them then? Well, I mean, we uh, again, in my originally in my time when we started off first in the 1980s, 90s, up to the early 2000s, we by and large with a policy, if at all possible, have no babies in prison. Yeah. Prison is not the place for babies. End of story. And we were able to do that, by the way, with the support of 
various ministers for justice and officials in the Department of Justice at the time. And by and large, when a mum came in with a baby, we made pr- uh, arrangements for that mum to go out into the community yeah. in whatever way possible. Yeah. Um, and not be separated from her baby, which is awful as well. Absolutely, you know. absolutely. But uh, that changed over the years and we got more hardline as a society and more, uh, you know, politically tougher, I think. And officials also earned, uh, you know, um, you know, we had officials saying uh, towards the end of my time, you know, why, you know we have to, well, would that happen for a man? And I'd say, look, well, would you stop talking rubbish like this is, these are completely different circumstances. If you have a baby or if you have three or four children, the place to be is at home with your children. And uh, we know now from all the history of putting children into orphanages and all that rubbish that we know that the state could do better than homes that were struggling they couldn't they're grand. they wrecked their lives completely yeah. and they did way worse than if they left the children even if the facilities were inadequate and the parenting was inadequate it was better than what the state did yes. and uh, so but anyway nowadays yeah there are children in prison with their mums and they're kept and they're, they're kept for about a year and then if, if they're still the mum is still in prison she has to make arrangements for the child to be taken by her family and if not they're taken into care and uh so it's it's a uh, it's a. But again, addiction is causing a lot of those issues too. Is that I right? Say, like uh, a lot of women would be in there the women, because of addiction. Uh, oh, the vast vast yeah. numbers would be chronic, uh, poverty, and many other issues as well. So it, it would be. Uh, but uh, you know, we were trying to, and, and and the whole policy was to build up and to restore the person. That, you know, that's my word rather than rehabilitation because I don't. I, I just think that's a totally inappropriate word. It isn't a nice word. Sure, doesn't. No, I don't like it either. It's not a word work on one either no. because like if you break your leg and you want to be rehabilitated well the one <laughs> thing is driving you is I want that leg working again yes. towards when you talk about a person in prison being rehabilitated it's, I talk you know uh, around you know supporting the person to redirect himself or to reform himself or whatever that that, that that terminology is the most appropriate. But in the women's prison, certainly, again, you're talking about a very slow process of building up uh, esteem, giving, I mean, you know, I, I have mums, uh, mothers who are brought into prison for neglect. They were convicted in the courts for, uh, you know, for neglecting their children and brought into prison. And my God, did they come in with a ringing condemnation from society, the media, the judges, everybody. And then I got to know them and and, and staff in New York said I got a mum better than I did, but I did get to know them. And within a, a couple of days, realised, oh my God, that poor misfortunate person. It hasn't got the knowledge, the skills, the education, the ability to parent, which is an assumption. Uh, sorry, everyone can know how to parent. Well, they don't actually. And I met a lot of people that just didn't understand, weren't able to care parent, hadn't the ability to do it, hadn't they? The, they probably the, weren't parented themselves terribly well either. And then that's, problems, yeah. Laura. Yeah. Uh, 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 psychological problems, ignorance, uh, uh, cultures that were really, you know, backgrounds that were really depressing, abused themselves since they were babies, I'd say, and a combination of all negatives. And then this woman is put up there on a pedestal and said, you are a disgrace. The poor misfortune, often, by the way, as well, which is another factor, under the influence, and I can say this because I'm a man, uh, under the influence of a bad, vicious, dangerous, devious man and sometimes he has a control at head a control over there that woman's life that was appalling yeah. and nobody from the state intervened and no services intervened and protected that woman and uh, until the, the children were found to be neglected and they were neglected as a result of ignorance uh, poor uh, you know p- poor sk- life skills and and knowledge and ability uh, and the negative influence uh, in, in some cases of a man so both the the positive thing was that when that person got help, got education, uh, teachers and psychologists and different people working with them, some of the prison staff, the, the, the change, the transition was just phenomenal because that person began to realise, God, I didn't know that. I, these are things I can learn to and do. And that is actually so, they do, they actually don't know. And like none of us are given a handbook when we're given, when we have our babies, you know, the majority of us will muddle through, but that is the reality. Absolutely. I mean, I've always found this amazing. The the expectation and the belief that every single person who has a baby has the ability uh, to parent that baby. There's nothing further from the truth. And even capable, well-educated parents struggle. Well, then what do you think 
you know, if you're on the top floor of a, a ten uh, floor high apartment with no supports and and no uh, education and no social skills and no life skills, how the hell? I mean, we had women inside in in the Dokas and in the old prison in Mount Joy with one particular woman, and I think she had, uh, you know, she gave birth to about fourteen children. Every one of them were taken from her at birth and put into care. But she continued to have baby after baby year. And she was, you know, the misfortunate person hadn't, you know, one ounce of intelligence, uh, no, uh, you know, common sense or ability. And she was just vulnerable and she was homeless and she continued to be abused and, immu you know, by men and manipulated. And she was a mother every year. Um, but nobody said, hold on a minute, this is just, just crazy. Uh, she was just left there to you know, continue on a lifestyle that was absolutely chaotic. And so she'd been taken and looked after or given some that's... kind of education or put on birth control, not even put on birth control, like, you know, even cared for, I'd say, Laura, cared sim, for, just yeah. cared for on the yeah. outside. If somebody just, or some services just took her and, uh, yeah. no, I remember Newell O'Fuelan, the late Newell O'Fuelan coming up to the women's prison, getting permission to talk to her uh, in a very positive way now, not an exploit, uh, in, in, in exploiting her, uh, but to talk to her in a very in a very caring uh, compassionate way to try to highlight this and and she wrote a wonderful uh, uh, page on the Irish Times at the time about this uh, poor, uh, poor misfortune Winnie was yeah. her name her surname or her Christian name and uh, Winnie was you know but she was more the victim of circumstances than any victim of crime. Yeah. Uh, and these are, the, these are the sort of things that people just don't understand or don't know. Or like young, very young girls uh, being single parents and, and being out there, you know, with no particular supports, uh, often having the ability to bond with the child. Uh, the child is a novelty for the first six months and they're still only 15 or 16. And you can imagine by the time they're 20, they're, they're now, you know, they have a five or six-year-old. They're still children, really. And you can can see where you know this it's as it's a life of struggle and it's a life of, you can understand how a person uh, would break down or go on drugs or whatever it is Absolutely. so they're vulnerable from day one and they're exploited and then and then they end up you know be you know uh, uh, you know be the scapegoat and, and 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 I go back of course I go back to the thing that they have to take responsibility as well but if we don't intervene with those sort of people early on and provide supports and and all sorts of other uh, services you know, I was on the board of Bernardo's for many years and, and uh, during my time there, uh, there was a wonderful project introduced in Limerick by Bernardo's where they used to send professional people uh, into the homes of, of families that were struggling to get the breakfast in the morning, to help them get child for day for school and get them out to school. And uh, when the school was over, they went back in again, got them lunch, uh, did homework with them and all that. Those sort of projects are the sort of projects that I think have, have a great chance of succeeding because they help the parent to pay and better. Yeah. They're not taking over, but they're supporting and encouraging and facilitating and showing them how to do it, which yeah. is, you know, and... and um, and is it a matter of funding then to, like, absolute, you know, is absolute, it just... Uh, it's a matter of funding and resources. And we just must remember, uh, because this is very important to remember, that if the state today, 2002, will only intervene in a family, or a child or with a family uh, that's struggling at the very extreme. You're talking about crisis, in in ultra crisis situation, there's lots and lots of look, the Children Act of two thousand and one. What, what does it say that every family that's struggling, every child that's struggling, should have their own social worker? That's not honoured in no way. Simply why? Because we don't have the social workers. We don't have the services there to provide families with those sorts of support. And when we were looking at those sorts of issues on how do you change the culture and the, the areas that supply all the people, the pri deprived areas that supply all the the people to prison. The schemes and, and initiatives like those are the ones that have yeah. the greatest chance. Helping the parents to parent better, helping the children to grow and to mature uh, by in, involving themselves in, you know, introducing the proper food, proper structures, uh, helping the child with education because education being such a vital thing and, and helping the child to build their confidence. That's... But they are long term projects, and they and they need a lot of a lot of resources. And the reality is, and we just have to admit it as a society, we don't care. Of course, we don't care because it's we, not us. 
is that us? Yeah. Uh, one of the things I, I actually dealt with it way back in, in the early part of my time in Mount Joy because we, we, you know, we got a, a lot of bad publicity and negative publicity. And I remember going on, on uh, you know, publicly and, and challenging that very thing, them and us, them. I said, they're not them, them, the prisoners, they're us. Mm -hmm. They grew up in our areas, in our streets. They went to our schools. They live in our communities. They're us. And if they end up in prison, we, all of us, it's us. But them, that's lovely. They, them, they're the bad, they're the villains, they're the bad, you know. We don't have any responsibility. Well, we do actually have responsibility. We have a broad community, uh, a citizen-based uh, uh, responsibility to ensure that every child has the opportunity to grow to his potential, or her potential. As the, as the proclamation said, is it, is it a case today that every child born in Ireland has a chance, as an equal and a fair chance to grow to his or her, her potential? My answer to that is, not on your no way, no way. There's but sure, it's all nimbyism as well. Like we all love the idea of oh, let's you know give, let's let travellers say, for instance, settle in you know uh, an area. But God forbid it be my area and the value of my home then be reduced or my um, my perceived value of my home be reduced as a result. So it's all well and good. Like we all want to do good things in inverted commas, but actually executing them is about a complete mindset change, isn't it? It's much more... Yeah, it's massive. Like, I mean, as I said, we, we don't, we think we do. Uh, we sort of, uh, we try to project that we care. And and the amazing thing about Ireland and the culture in Ireland, and it is an amazing thing, we are far more generous and far more, you know, outgoing and 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 uh, reactive when something like uh, Ukraine happens. We, we, you know, we are good at that. And for a yeah. small little country, we are very generous. And when there's a tragedy around the world or a disaster, we we are very generous and not just with money but with people as well and skills and very skilled uh, professional people we're giving up their time to go off and to help we are good at that both as a government and as a society and this is where I take the government because the government represents you know the people and it's the government that should be and when you're allocating resources and giving whatever they're giving to and uh, like resources into poor areas and that we should be discriminating or you know gravely in favour of those areas yes. uh, rather than just throwing it Little, little, you know, the small, the the crumbs from the table, from his master table. That's exactly what happens. It is. It's the crumbs that eventually are given out to those areas, and they are the areas that need, you know, the full loaves because yeah. they are the people that are suffering the most. And I'm not ever, I'm not the slightest confident that I'll ever see the day when our society will be that caring and that equality will mean equality because equality at the moment is rubbish. We just talk about equality as if, you know, we're working Working towards it. What do we mean by that? Even in terms of men and women, equality. What sort of equality are we talking about? Mm. We have total inequality. And uh, you know, you'll hear people who are very sophisticated talking about their rights. Fine, and I'm delighted to hear them talking about their rights. But you'll never or seldom hear them talking about the rights of those who are really discriminated against. Yeah. And we have thousands and hundreds of thousands of people uh, in this country at the moment and hundreds and thousands of families who are gravely dis discriminated against in terms of opportunity and the resources. And as you said, you know, do they get the opportunity? To, they don't. No. And we don't We don't encourage it either. But it goes back to the political system as well and the short-term gains and the re-elections. You know, if we were to look at it and actually have proper projects in place where we could envisage we bring a family from, you know, birth right up, right through to, you know, 80 years time when that baby is, is a, you know, a great granny herself or himself. And we put the resources into that and put the resources into those people. But because, you know, that's 80 years away or it wouldn't even take 80 years to change that. It would take, it could take 20 just to kind of follow them through. We don't want to do it because it's too long away and sure the current political people, people that are in, in power won't be around. And there's, that is the huge issue. Do you think there's any country in the world that's doing it right well, some countries are, you know, I suppose the Scandinavian countries and the Nordic yeah, countries would. are probably the best. Yeah. In, but I know from, from my time uh, that they were even struggling to hold on to what they had rather than increasing it. But they certainly had a better uh, system in place in relation to how they responded to criminality. And I suppose the difference as well, there was a fundamental difference that I know. And the late uh, Professor Liam Ryan of Maynooth as well. Uh, a, a sociologist who was lecturing him in youth and had studied this a lot. He also said the same thing. Uh, but he uh, highlighted often that Ireland, England and Scotland in particular 
seem to have a type of individual person who ended up in criminality coming from all the, with all the baggage we already have discussed. Poor education, high levels of addiction, high levels of mental health, poor self-esteem, all that sort of baggage. And that Ireland, England and Scotland in particular seem to have a huge percentage of our prison population coming from those uh, backgrounds. When I was, I, know, I had the privilege of, of visiting Denmark and Sweden uh, to visit prisons there uh, during my time. And the one thing I noticed, uh, Laura, above everything else was the, the, the prisoners I met in Sweden and in, in Denmark um, were, were far more normal in terms of how okay. they looked, their education levels, uh, Everything about them, they, they, were they, were just, they were just pure criminals. They were, they were educated criminals in yeah. the sense that they seem to be more a cross section of society in Sweden and in Denmark than a, like our prison population does not represent a wide cross section of Irish society. If you go to Mount Joy, I'm telling you. You know, you will notice that the the vast, vast numbers of people in Mount Joy and in our prison system in Ireland and and in England they represent our, they're from those backgrounds, poorly educated, all the things I said, and that is an amazing thing. So that the the Swedish and and uh, and, and other uh, these Nordic countries and, and and Scandinavian countries they seem not to have the same levels of poverty ingrained in their communities that created and you know, almost, you know, the causes of uh, uh, criminality. So, and so they're, they're, in many ways, they had all the basics like education so that you weren't starting from minus like you would here yeah. uh, with, with, the, with the levels of, of, of trying to make progress. Uh, and I think so the societies were more, I, I suppose, uh, tolerant as well. I mean, we still have huge difficulties around if you have a criminal record. If you have a criminal, I say to young people in schools, if you have a criminal record, you are at a massive disadvantage. If you have a prison uh, and a criminal record, you are at a massive disadvantage because once you get a criminal record, you know, by and large, it stays with you for the rest of your life and it is a serious inhibiting factor. You in have the to story. declare it when you're going for a job as well. well if you do, if you do, you probably won't get the job and if you don't, you'll probably get cut out anyway. So you're always in the dilemma if you have yeah. a criminal record. Will I tell them? Or will I always tell them? Tell them. You're far better off to go in and say to the person, look, yeah, I was in prison because I said, if you don't tell it and you're caught, you'll be sacked anyway and you'll be sacked because you have told lies. At least being honest, there's a chance you might get the job. It depends on what the crime is. But some crimes, you, you will not get a job in the yeah. story. Now, I can understand, by the way, why, you know, if you are in for sexual related offences, for instance, why I, well, I would certainly, I, I wouldn't say that that should be totally ignored. But I, I, we should certainly try to understand and, and try to evaluate what are the risks, because it's all about risks. We, you, we often imply people are, people are implied that they're very high risk, but nobody knows they're high risk. But yeah. if you have a criminal record, you know the risk is slapping you in the face straight away or staring you in the face and it may not be as much of a risk as the people that we don't know it may be a plus actually because at least now you know uh, you know what to be careful about so uh, it's it's uh, so somebody for is that rob stuff. If he's uh, you know doing a job that there's no money involved in, that there's no like like working on a building site, you know there's no risk at all. Uh, yeah. You know, if you have somebody that has that has, has committed offences against children, and they are not, they are highly prote- Children are protected from them, and their work is not in, in the slightest way connected with children. Well, then they are no risk in that context. But we sort of have a blank, you know, blank. Uh, and is there is there a is there a reform program for prisoners to go out and try and get them work? Is is there anything no. like that? No. The nearest thing we had to to that was a, a project that was introduced around 2002 in in Mountjoy, first of all, called the Connect Project. And uh, I mean, for me, that was a great, uh, p- had a huge potential. And that was what it was about, connecting prisoners. In our case, uh, it wasn't exclusively for prisoners. The Connect Project was for anybody from who was disconnected from co- co- employment to be connected to employment. And it was f- funded by the social funds, uh, social inclusion funds of the EU at the time. And we got it off the ground in Mount Joy through the efforts of a man called Martin Hickey, who was coordinator of work and training in Mount Joy, or in the prison service at the time. And uh, that had the potential, Laura, to connect people with, uh, with, with work. And, and it started off on a, on a, which was, you know, a very basic 14 weeks introduction. And, and, and the introduction was all about getting the person to uh, reflect on his own circumstances and what exactly had he the ability to do and, and what did he need to do to get there. So if somebody said, for instance, I want to be a carpenter, 
Well, they said, right, what do you need to have to be yeah. a capital? And once you discover, for instance, that you're a heroin addiction, well, naturally, the, what the facilitator said, right, well, we have to deal with that first. Because there's no, you're not, education, can you read or write? No. Well, then you, you need, you know. So very, you know, over a period of time, they were, they were uh, made aware of, I suppose, the steps. And then, though, the real part of it was, the next step then was almost holding their hands. You know, if, if, if your education needs, three times a week, four times a week, you're going to go to the education, to uh, remedial education. And the facilitator made sure that he went uh, to the school and, and you know, all, and same with the accommodation where they were leaving and all that sort of hand-holding. And that was certainly had great potential. And that was scuppered and 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 uh, dropped and uh, sabotaged. Uh, I have always said it was sabotaged by the by the Department of Justice at the time and and uh, uh, by officials in the Department of Justice at the time and others. Um, that project had unlimited potential and it involved prison staff in the process as well, which is a very important part because prison staff uh, you know, originally were very much ostracized and not involved or not encouraged to participate in those sort of positive programs. And we tried to change that and did change it to some degree in the Dokers as well, where this, you know, the prison staff became, you know, house parents in the houses and, and positive advocates for the, uh, and what was amazing as well is that many of the women that were in the Dokers in my time, they confided in those staff members uh, to, to a huge degree and they got to know them very well and they got to and as a result of that they developed, uh, developed a positive professional relationship with them which meant that they could you know they could go, you know, the, the woman in prison could go to that person and get advice and get help and and that's what you're talking about, a sort of networking of people working with the prisoner to help the prisoner uh, if he or she is motivated. Um, so the fact that that was scrapped and the fact that there isn't a programme now, like what chance does a prisoner have of coming out and getting a job? Because as I know, I know as a mother of three boys, you know, I've one, one's a teenager, like they always need to be doing something. And men, by their very definition, I think, you know, women to an extent as well, obviously, but, you know, to go out and have a job and have a purposeful job or something where they're actually going out and earning a living is very important for their sense of self, sense of self-esteem, puts money on the table or food on the table. So what chance do they have then of, of this reform that we're talking about if they can't even go out and get, get a job after their prison sentence? Yeah, um, first of all, I'm sure there are small little projects, you know, it's still around in different prisons yeah. and different areas, small uh, and always sold, by the way, to the public as if they're sig Massive. very significant. And you know, they yeah. well, only involve ten prisoners. I was yeah. a four thousand two hundred. Like yeah. so, they, you know, so we have all that sort of old, old uh, messing about as well and propaganda and spinning. You know, uh, but uh, so I'm sure that there's 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 some projects around. But if you talk if you're talking about it on a national, uh, comprehensive scale, there's nothing of any significance. The vast numbers of prisoners leave in prison leave with nothing. Uh, and, and, and what, another element of it that you wouldn't realize is that often, you know, going to prison for an individual person is a very traumatic experience. But would you believe this? Leaving prison can be even more traumatic because when he was going into prison, for instance, or she, but again, back to the vast numbers being men, they might have had a job. They might have had accommodation. They might be living with a family. They might have a lot of structure. They're involved in community, in sport, or all sorts of things. And they go to prison. They lose the job. Their family often disintegrate. Uh, you know, they, they lose their connection with society. They have the stigma of the crime. And so when they come back out, they're actually, they're in a minor situation. They were far better off before they went in. And on top of losing maybe a partner or a, a spouse and family growing up while they're in prison and disowning them and the job gone, they come out with nothing. And the vast numbers of people, believe you me, come out of prison with nothing, to nothing, going out to nothing. And if you're coming out of prison with nothing, going into nothing, uh, and, uh, and and you add on things like addiction or mental health issues or low self-esteem and poor work records and poor work skills, then the, 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 the prospects out there on the horizon for that person leaving prison are very, very slim. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's quite grim, isn't it, when you think about it? Yeah. When we were talking about Scandinavia and, you know, the, the prison system there um, and the fact that in Ireland we've like this cross-section of society that seems to be, you know, the only type that are type of people, no, aren't us, you know, of course, like this is what we're saying. Um, in America, obviously, the prison system is absolutely, you know, it's it's shocking, isn't it? Like it's a business. You know, it's almost like put them in prison so we can, you know, get more bums on seats, get more food because the food industry so that serves them. Like, 
is I I can't envisage that would ever go that way. But we're we're probably a little bit more similar to that than Scandinavia, just in terms of the fact that the cross section of society that is in prison there is mainly black, poor people, men. You know, from that section of society that's really deprived. Do you have any? You yeah, know, I mean, the American system is appalling. And, yeah. Uh, but it is a very popular system in America. And Trump, exa- for example, highlighted and exploited it and humiliate them, like we put them in pink clothes and, uh, you know, chaining and all that sort of stuff. That's all, um, all that sort of stuff is all... It's really subtle. I never thought about the pink clothing oh, before. Oh, just to humiliate. <gasps> yeah, you deliberately humiliate. Um, chaining people as well is another humiliation. You see the American system, from even if you're a, a charged with the most minor crime, you're chained, uh, legs, hands, a lot. Uh, Going a bit like that in Ireland as well, say handcuffing like uh, is automatic, all these sort of things. You can see the guards doing it, the prison service doing it, even though the person is no risk. I always believed, okay, and in my time when I was young in the prison service, uh, the handcuffs, for instance, were only used when they you felt they needed to be used. In other words, the, there was a likelihood that the person absconded. Now, if you have an 80 year old on a crutch, he'll be handcuffed because, again, it's part of the culture and it's part of this thing of humiliating the person often not consciously but unconsciously and the power and, as well of isn't course it? the power and and the vast numbers of the public are delighted you know this is what he you know he needs to be he needs to be shown a lesson or he needs to be brought down or whatever it would be the american system is horrible uh, the irish system as bad as it is and it has its weaknesses but it is far superior i would say and the most important element of it is there's there's less we well, i'd be saying sometimes there's not enough of political interest but at least there, there's less political involvement and interference. And uh, while it's popular, uh, you know, to be hard on crime and all this sort of, of rubbish, uh, you hear these, uh, you know, these, these, these uh, comments being made hard on crime and hard on the cause. I of love crime. the way you call it rubbish because it absolutely is. It's absolutely just rubbish. Horseshit. Hard, yeah, hard <laughs> on crime and hard yeah. on the causes of crime and uh, all this sort of rubbish. But at the end of the day, we still have a system where the Minister for Justice of the day is, you know, personally responsible for the prison server and that's a plus because at least that person is in cabinet and they're responsible for it and it's certainly and I always believe by the way that the state should never hand over its its uh, responsibility to and as they do in America to any private enterprise under no circumstance why because the state has intervened uh, you know to, uh, as I uh, you know and taken the freedom and the liberty from a citizen of the state and said to that person, you are not fit to have and to be given the privilege of uh, your liberty and your freedom. And we are going to take you out of that, remove your liberty and your freedom and put you into prison. I believe that that is has to be the ultimate sanction and interference of the state. And the state should never be allowed uh, to have anything other than personal direct responsibility for that individual because on the print on the on, on the basis of why you're there in the first place you're there because you the state has decided you're not fit to have for the freedom and we're going to show you a different way and that's why it is so important that prisons are not corrupt and that prisons treat people in a very humane dignified a uh, lawful way to break the law and to do something illegal to a prisoner in prison is for me the worst thing you can do because it says the state is now as corrupt as that individual was on the outside. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that completely. What are your thoughts on, I know we've touched on the drug issues before, but what are your thoughts on legalising drugs or certain drugs and making it less easy for, say, the drug cartels to, you know, uh, bully themselves around and also become a more tolerant society of people that, say, smoke cannabis. Like, like for instance, in Amsterdam, there's a lot less harder drugs used in Amsterdam because they they reckon it's because of their, their tolerance of the use of soft drugs. What what are your do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I should, of course I do. Um, <laughs> I knew you would. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> totally against sleek lags and drugs, but okay. I would, wouldn't I? Um, I hate drugs. I I just believe that drug, and I say this all the time in school. Um, there's no such thing as a harmless drug. Rubbish. Uh, you know this better than anybody. But uh, I just um, as as a as a, a, a non medical person, I I am just convinced there's no such thing as a harmless drug. Every drug. Uh, and especially recreational drugs are all mood changers so they all uh, 
uh, they have an impact on the old brain and our thinking process and all the sort of uh, stuff related to that. And therefore, uh, they do actually uh, have an, uh, an immediate impact on our judgment and our reaction. And, and they're addictive in most cases and they do long-term damage. And if a person is not normal when they're under the influence of drugs and all that. So my message would be, um, uh, and it's a big, a different message to criminalizing people who use drugs. I've, I'm very, I'm very tolerant and very open around that. Uh, but uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't be in favor of, of criminalizing people automatically because they're fine, found with a giant or something and giving them a criminal record and destroying their lives. Uh, yeah. Because my long-term ambition, uh, objective would be that this person uh, can uh, deal with whatever it is and get over it. So my message, I think that if you legalize drugs, you're saying to young people, it's okay. They're legal. Now, we, you could come back and say to me, well, what about alcohol? I, yeah. I believe, I honestly believe that if, you know, if alcohol was being introduced today, there'd be uproar. A lot of people would be opposed to it on the basis that it is also. And we forget sometimes as well, by the way, because of, of the other, other drugs that, you know, alcohol is, alcohol is still a massive issue in Ireland and oh. causes havoc for families and for individuals and has a massive uh, negative consequences and is still a major contributory factor to crime as well. Uh, we forget that now sometimes with, with drugs, but it, back well, to... Alcohol is so abundant in Irish society. Yeah, sure, you know, shocking if you think about it. It's only 11 o'clock, otherwise I would have offered you a drink, John. Yeah, so, and, and every, you know, yeah. about every, every, every social we go, occasion yeah. is drunk. And almost like, you know, you're looked at in a negative way if you go out and say, oh, I'm not drinking. I go on. Why aren't yeah, you drinking? You yeah. know, are you pregnant? Or what was yeah. the story? Like, it's almost like negative if you don't want to drink. So there's that huge issue that we have here in Ireland. And alcohol is a drug. I speak about it a lot that it is a drug. So, so, you know, what's the difference between, say, alcohol and, and cannabis? And like you say yourself, alcohol, if it was introduced today, would probably get a lot of backlash. Absolutely. Uh, anyway, my, my on, on, on the whole thing of legalizing drugs, I'm opposed to it. Uh, uh, I, 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 my message all the time is that, that uh, drugs are not, you know, they're not harmless. They do leave an impact and they do uh, cause a lot of mental, psych psychological, emotional damage long term as well as short term. And my message would be, you know, healthy living. And we are talking about diet and exercise and all that. I'm, I'd say if you're talking about legalized drugs, you're completely undermining all that philosophy about positive, healthy uh, living uh, uh, lifestyles. Um, in, in terms of, uh, and then the question is, what happens when you, you know, uh, I don't believe for a moment, by the way, that if, if we eliminated drugs and legalized heroin and legalized drugs and more, that criminality uh, would disappear. Because I know, for instance, for methadone, there's awful skullduggery in methadone. And when people are prescribed methadone over a period of time and when they are given, you know, a week or a fourth is supply. I mean, there's a lot of uh, people that are corrupted in that and selling it and misusing it and topping up on it. And we were taught in prison as well, we is back, you know, at a, a draconian a draconian at approach in prisons in the old days. I mean, you know, you had, you had to suffer and no di no di uh, you know, maybe three days detox at the best and people were going through horrendous times and cold turkeys and hot turkeys and all sorts of turkeys. Oh and it was horrendous. And then we introduced methadone maintenance and methadone detoxification and all that. And we were told that if you had methadone maintenance that uh, a lot of prisoners wouldn't use. But th that was not uh, proven. And when they got methadone maintenance, they certainly took it, but they'd also top up on it like quite a number of indeed so and that becomes addictive itself as you know of and that and becomes another issue on the street also yeah and it's but it's corrupted so I honestly believe that uh, you know the, the answer to drugs is not to legalise them but is to try to educate people and I suppose the other point about drugs is that it's very seldom driven home is that the middle classes who are very much into cocaine and crack cocaine and all the more sophisticated drugs they are never associated with the criminality and they're never associated that they are contributory factors Factors to that criminality because when somebody the gangland feuds are all about control who's selling and who's controlling the supply and when that middle class person is is getting his fix or whatever it is or his line or her line of cocaine they never say to themselves wow I'm actually contributing to this culture yeah. and I'm indirectly causing uh, you know it's like child pornography and rightly so where a, a person who uses any pornography of a child is regarded no no you mightn't be doing it yourself directly but you because you're using it you are indirectly contributing to child abuse. That philosophy is right in child abuse 
I believe it should be also right in terms of drug abuse. That while you mightn't be out doing the criminal stuff, you are contributing indirectly to the criminality. You are connecting to these gangland feuds and all that sort of stuff because you are taking it. You create drug. a market for the, the product as well. You're, you know, Absolutely, you're, you're, surely, you're yeah. So they, but they don't, they, again, it's a no. twisted sense of, of uh, I suppose, honesty and fairness and all that. Well, I'm not doing this, this horrible uh, violence, but you are actually do, indirectly doing it. So, uh, so it's, it's, uh, and back and back again, I I still I still stand on my old belief that uh, it is a choice that people make, and that's what I say, uh, Laura. One of the things that I would say though that is, again I I'm I, every chance I get I say it, and I want to take this chance to say this as well. You know, I uh, what I say to young people in school, and uh, especially boys, is you know never do drugs. And I explain to them, eighty eight percent of cri crime in Mount Chai, eighty percent eighty eight percent of criminals in Mount Chai in my time were directly or indirectly related to drugs. That's a phenomenal figure. 88% directly or indirectly related to drugs. The directly was bringing, importing drugs or growing drugs or storing drugs or transporting drugs. Indirectly was robbing to get money for the drugs, for yeah. their addiction. But uh, when I'm saying to young people, I'm saying never do drugs. But then I, I always say, I'm a realist. I know some of you will do drugs. I'm Africa when I'm dealing with anyone over 15, I say, I'm actually, I'd be surprised if some of you already haven't been dabbling in drugs. Yeah. But the one thing I do say, and I think I, do, I don't believe it's anything like that, the status it deserves and the highlighting it, it needs and deserves, and that is never owe money for drugs. And uh, a lot of people don't get that, but I always say to them, the day you owe money for drugs is the day you have taken the first step in the slippery slope to human disaster. It's as serious as that, because once you start owing money for drugs, your first thing to do is you tell lies. And who do you tell lies to? Your own parents. Who, what's your next step when the lies don't work? I need money for, I need this. That'll dry up. The next step is robbing. Who do you rob from? Your own parents. Yeah. So now you're telling lies and you're robbing. And of course that dries up. And then what do you do? You expand your, and you start robbing from outside. And then what happens? You're not able to get enough money. So now you become a dealer or you become a transporter of drugs and you gradually end up in absolute shit. And then because of the culture, you can't go to court and tell the truth. Because who are you doing the drugs for? Who are you making? Who are you bringing those home drugs for? Who are you storing the drugs for? You can't say because that's your that's that's your 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 death warrant signed. So yes. now the young lad that started off for oh, ten euro, I often take out twenty euro out of my pocket and say, if I give everyone even twenty euro now, uh, would you be rich? And they'll all say, no. I said, no, you wouldn't. Go down to town, you get a small little few little parasites, whatever, a couple of bottles of whatever. But you're not rich. But then I'd say, but if you owe me 20 euro, now it's a lot of money, isn't it? Because it's a lot of money because you don't have it. Yeah. So where are you going to get 20 euro to give to me? And uh, That's an interesting analogy, actually. Yeah, but it's true. Yeah. You owe me, well, it's only 20 euro. Yeah, but you don't have it. So where are you going to get it? You have to rob it. Huh. So now you're a robber. And you can see the pressure. And I said, you know, I said, you wake up at four in the morning and you have four text messages. I'll meet you outside the school at eight o'clock in the morning. Have that 50 euro for me. So I said, what are you going to do? I said, you won't sleep for the rest of the day. You're coming out, you're looking, you're running in the back of the school. You and come this home. is what happens, these young lads, the young teenagers. You in know. their hundreds. Oh my goodness. In their hundreds. And Laura, it, it goes on from there and then the parents get involved and then the drug pusher exagger exaggerates the amount and instead of maybe own, he might owe a hundred, he'll say, you're a grand. Who's going to contradict them? There's no one to do it. There's no one ledgers there. There's no... So... Yeah. So the next thing, the parents then in their naivety pay the thousand. So you could see the whole thing getting out of hand. The stress of that, the pressure of it. Um, the guy eventually ends up in prison, which offered the deal. Do you think the debt is gone in prison? No. They're now manipulated in prison to use knives and, to, and these uh, uh, violent acts that are carried out in prison. The, the lowest of the low minnows, the most, the bottom of the pile in terms of the gangs, they are the guys that are told, you go down and stab him. The young lad is, is you know, they join the gangs because they think they get protection. Once yeah. you join the gang you, can, gang, you can never leave, by the way. So when you join whatever gang it is, now you're a member for life because everyone else says, oh, he's, been, he's a member of the Killahan gang. He's a member of the Hutch gang. So now you're labeled for life. And you're in prison, you're labelled for life as well, and you stay with that gang, but you'll be, certainly you'll get the dirty jobs. So now you're told to go off and cut somebody. The young lad has never been involved in violence in his life. Now he has a choice, either carry out that or be cut up himself. So you can see... Oh, it's, it's just awful. Horrible. 
And young lads, I miss them. I miss them. I, what I say to young lads is, and it's the truth, I said, I met thousands and thousands of decent people in prison, which I did. I said, the only, the common denominator was what? They made one bad choice. And that one bad choice led them to making hundreds of bad choices, including ending up in prison. Yeah. But this idea that they're from Mars or that they're, you know, scum or, you know, there's very, a lot of them are very decent people. Of course. They made bad choices and bad choices might be around the company they kept or that, that one first choice, the, the, the giant, or that day they made, they owed, you know, I don't know. And and drug pushers love giving drugs for nothing. And I say to them, do, do they think they're, they're kind or generous? They love you? That they're giving you drugs for nothing? They know that once I get him in a state where he owes me money or she owes me money, now I have her. And, and you can mention it already, people, decent people getting caught up and then being exploited. And I tell girls and women that they are going to be exploited in a different way. Men are usually exploited in terms of importing drugs and traveling with drugs and storing drugs. Women is often sexual favors. And you can imagine the horrend. No wonder then they go on more drugs. And I say to them, you know, you, you, you get the 100 euro, you pay the 100 euro, you're a nervous wreck. And the next thing he says to you, do you want another line? And of course you're in bed. So you say, yeah, I do. And the hundred so euro like now it comes two hundred euro, yeah. so you're you're go home and you're worse off than ever, and you can see the stress. And the more anxiety and more stress you have, the more you need drugs. And they know that, and they don't care. So it's a horrendous, a ho and it's horrendous for parents, and it's horrendous for families and brothers and sisters when somebody. The one of the worst things and most stressful and horrendous things to happen to a family is one child to get involved in drugs and to end up addicted. Yeah. It's horrendous. Like it's actually horrendous. No, it is awful. I can only imagine. Uh, you know, I've seen it. I can only imagine what it's like to actually be it and, and live it. Can we touch a little bit on mental health, please? Because uh, mental health, you know, has huge impacts on people's lives, and I certainly think that we're lacking an awful lot of mental health services here in Ireland. There is um, a very good psychiatrist who works within the criminal justice system as well, who would even say. The likes of, say, if you took the cohort of men that are in Mount Joy and you tested them for mental illness, even even ADHD, which is attention hyperactivity disorder, and you tested them, like a vast majority of them would test positive for some form of this, which is, you know, it leads to making poor decisions, making impulsive decisions uh, throughout your teenage years, your whole life. And then, you know, you end up either addicted because you're trying to, to, to self-medicate, to to, to ease the mental anguish that you're feeling and you end up in prison because you've made, made made poor choices. So your thoughts on on the mental health services, I suppose, and then also the, the mental health issues that we that we see in prisons as a direct result of the fact that we are underserving our youth by not picking up mental health issues early enough. Yeah, absolutely. I'm um, a huge critic of the, of the system, the lack of resources, the lack of investment, the lack of prioritising mental health services and supports. Um, see what again back to what you said Laura people just don't understand and they just don't ap appreciate a child for instance that has speech difficulty and who needs speech therapy on a regular basis uh, from the age of three onwards and that service is supplied that child is probably going to be protected and is going to be helped in keep a direction that if that service is not available to that child that one difficulty alone speech difficulty will cause that child stress, anxiety, difficulties in primary school, a whole lot of other factors, and eventually leading to depression and mental health issues and all that. And that's just a one example of a way when we read about waiting lists of two or three years for speech therapy for children. So what? So by the time they a get... A child is going to be seven or eight yeah. or nine before he's going to get uh, problems maybe with hearing, problems different personal issues, ADHD, or ADD, all these different personality disorders, mental health themselves will be very selective. And they say, well, he hasn't a mental health issue. He's a personality disorder. For a lay person like me in Mount Joy, say, well, I don't know, but what he sure ain't acting normally. Yeah. His normal people don't do what he's doing. Yeah. And, uh, but he hasn't a mental illness. And, and I have to accept that he may not have an in, uh, a mental uh, illness on the, on the basis of the, of the evaluation 
evaluation and the, and the prognosis that a psychiatrist would carry out. But has he or she serious uh, difficulties in relation to how they behave? Yes, they have, serious. And there's often nothing for that. Uh, the whole thing of ADHD and, and how that is left often to, you know, to grow and to destroy the child. So there are so many factors. Uh, and then if the child has some mental health issues, again, uh, you're taught whatever services are there for children up to 16, then there's another big gap from 16 to adulthood. And, and some of them have, to, you know, in a part of the country, there's no services for children at all. They have to be linked into the adult services, which are yeah. totally inappropriate for children. So you have, hu listen, you have huge issues. One in four in Mount Jai in my time in, in scientific research undertaken by the late Dr. Paul Omani, one in four had inpatient uh, psychiatric history. One in four. And 40% had contact with psychiatric service. So there has always been an overlap between criminality and uh, mental health issues. And prisons are often used as a sort of a dumping ground for people who are a bit disruptive, have mental health issues, but are also involved in criminality. Um, then you have the victims of crime of those who have mental health issues who end up victims of crime they're looking for you know punishment and they're looking for an answer from the state in relation to their particular issue and so the state you know and the courts in particular often don't have the choices to direct those people away to areas that would be more appropriate yeah. so what happens the vast numbers are end up in prison now the in-house facilities for prison as I said earlier on have vastly improved but we still have a major issue in relation to those who need uh, uh, inpatient care. So overall, my my uh, my uh, and prison. Then, by the way, as well, I have to mention this as well. Being locked up so long, which they are, they're locked up 16, 17 hours minimum every day. Uh, the whole culture of prison, that environment, in prison, that is a contributory factor to definitely depression and mental health issues, uh, and leading often to mental health, uh, you know, and mental illness as well. Uh, so they they. The whole mental health side is certainly an integral part of the difficulties that are created that, while, and why some people end up in prison. Uh, and the neglect then of children, especially that often, I mean, I came across to myself as adults where the parents had done everything in their power to get the service that the support from 10 and 11 onwards. And those services weren't there or they were inadequate. And eventually at 18 or 19 or 20, that person committed a horrendous crime, including murder. And again, very seldom is that highlighted that that neglect indirectly contributed to the person uh, doing something uh, as drastic as, 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 as murdering somebody. Uh, so it's a massive teen, issue. And those teenage years, those like, you know, you said the 11 to 14 where the hormones are raging and something like ADHD or other mental illness may not be picked up because you can't get the services. Um, it just leads to a lifetime yeah. potentially of of. No, no, I said, crime. I, like I said, Time and time again, I, when I was in Mount Jai, we had up to 800 prisoners there at some stages, male prisoners. And I often said I'd walked through Mount Jai uh, for a long time before I could pick out somebody and say, listen, he's a pretty normal guy. Most of the guys had issues, yeah. like impulsiveness. Now, some of them would have all the symptoms of ADH, but they'd have some of them, like impulsiveness. Um, you know, yeah. Straight in, no questions asked. Uh, you know, attra att att attracted to excitement. Anything doesn't happen. Uh, yeah. in, in they're gone. Afterwards, when you said to them, what are you doing there? I don't know. Were you in? I don't know. So they just do that uh, fidgeting, uh, lack of concentration, uh, all the, you know, all, all those symptoms. They're widespread in the prison population. Yes. Now, whether they justify our, our fulfill a, 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 a prognosis of ADHD, I don't know, but I certainly know from my knowledge of it that they have many of the symptoms. Yeah. I'd say nearly every one of them. Yeah. And, and even if you had on mental health issues that, that one in every four have addiction uh, issues that a huge number of them have, uh, you know, when you add it all together into the pot, then you are talking about a, 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 sub, you know, a group of people that have many, many issues. And that's when you, you know, when they talk about that word, again, in inverted commas, rehabilitation, that's why people have no insight or knowledge or understanding of what the challenges are and the battle it is to try to get, you know, all these different little segments all dealt with at the same time. Yeah. Because if you, addiction, as you know, mental health and depression can lead to the addiction itself and, and, and addiction, you know, can lead to mental health so it's a vicious it's, it's circle, a vicious circle. and then we spoke about the disparity between uh, the education system for for middle class and you know m more impoverished backgrounds but certainly there is definitely um 
much disparity in services. So say, for instance, middle class parents may be able to pay for, pay privately for their child to be seen. Whereas you'd have a child in the inner, you know, in the inner city, they just can't be looked after because their parents, no matter what they do for them and try their best for them, can't get the services that they need. So again, that's perpetuating the whole thing about those six areas in Dublin are the ones that are most represented in, in, in Mount Joy because it is those people that are most, I suppose, disadvantaged and not looked after by us. Yeah, Isn't that I was right? That, uh, listen, 30 years ago, I'd say, I was at a talk in, in Limerick City around ADHD because uh, I used to take a bit of an active part in that because, again, of the connection to criminality. And I'll always remember a psychiatrist in Limerick at a, a public meeting where there was a big crowd of people because, again, it's, a, it's underground a bit and a lots of parents are affected by it and have difficulty with children with uh, ADHD or ADD. And he made that very statement that you made now. He said, I can tell you now, honestly, if you have money and resources, you have some chance. If you have no money and no resources, you have no chance because the services are just simply not there. And I, I think that is, you know, that is just the reality of it. Uh, you know, in, in, in terms of, you know, this, the lack of those sorts of services that, and the interventions and how appropriate, you know, at the appropriate age as well. Like it's no use often sitting in, you know, uh, uh, interventions when, it's five years too late. Yeah. I mean, there's so much damage done and so much time lost uh, that, you know, you, you can make up. And it can cause, you know, to the child to deteriorate and not to like school and to fall behind and, and all that. And uh, tension within a family unit as well. It can cause awful disruption within a family unit too. And just, absolutely. you know, it's... It affects so many and it's so far reaching. It affects relationships yeah. and it's fixed the child. And uh, look, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, again, it's uh, one, another one of the many fac uh, factors as, of life and, 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 and the factors that often are not recognised when people are talking about solutions. And that's what I always come back to. If you don't understand what the problems are, you know, those definitely will never come up with solutions because the solutions you go up with are rubbish. And that's why it's so important to go into these areas and, and start to live with the people yeah. And, and and start with what they have and, and what they know and build up with them uh, rather than going in to try to prescribe solutions. And you have to have too much of that. Oh, People yeah. you know, prescribing what the solution You have no idea what the solution is until you go in and meet the people. And you must accept them where they're at. I learned that in Mount Joy. There's no use in talking down to them. No. You've got to start off with where they're at and accept. Look, I wouldn't do that, but you know, but you did it, and 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 for you, it, it's it's acceptable, and it it's it's a practical way or whatever, and it's acceptable for you and your culture. But I wouldn't do it, and that's why I'm always saying to people, it's so important that you know people try to understand where they're coming from and the issues, not to make excuses for them, but simply to try to respond in a way that might help them in some way. Now, if you don't understand the problem, like I used to and still say, it, okay, the first step is to recognize the reality, whatever that reality is. And I'm afraid we're not good at that. We are very much at them. They, you know, they put your... Look, them are their individual people and there's none of them the same and they all have different issues and it's very complex. And as you mentioned yourself, Laura, it's a long-term strategy of 20, 30, 40 years of consistency, of intervention, getting the right people as well, and medical people, you know, like public health nurses, for instance, going into the communities, going into houses, good ones who have a good attitude. And they do amazing work. Uh, you know, they are the eyes and ears of the state, really, in terms of identifying problems and dealing with problems when they arise and building relationships with people. You ain't going anywhere until you build relationships. And and in prison, you know, the greatest title you, if you were working in prison, Laura, the greatest title you could get from prisoners is that you're sound. And if you got the title, you're sound, you are sound first, and secondly, your life in prison will be easy because you have earned it, and you have earned it on the basis of what that you're approachable, you're reliable, you're consistent, you're uh, caring, uh, you're compassionate, uh, you 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 you're generous with kindness, and that's not materialistic kindness, yeah. kind words and all that. But when you get the, and you're reliable and predictable, and and uh, and not a sneak or an underground, you're all front and you're honest and and truthful and all those and and as I said and and compassionate and when you get that title sound well then that's it off you go and and they tell each other no no she's sound and uh, and, but, and they won't give you that title if you're a you know if you're a harsh person or if you're too soft and you're not you know yeah. some people just sort of too wimpy and they will no they, they need somebody who's 
fairly straight and fairly upfront with them and fairly honest and can look them in the eyeball, uh, but at the same time that you know, that you're you're sort of kind and compassionate as well. Yeah. On that note, John, we've done a lot of talking. <laughs> um, I don't think there's anything else that I want to explore to, with you today, but I, what I would love to ask you is the two questions that I ask all my guests, which are, and you can answer them in any specific order, is there any one piece of advice that you would give today if you were speaking to young people today? And the second question is, for you, what is the meaning of life? Yeah, well, yes, for young people, I tell young people lots of things. We are after dealing with some of them already. Uh, but I, I suppose in, in terms of, of uh, a, a, just a small, general piece of advice for all young people, I would say to them, always show respect to every human being you meet on your life's journey. Always be kind and always be nice. It's lovely. It's very important to be kind. I'm, uh, you know, as a mom of three, I'm always trying to bring them up to, you know, just if you show a little bit of kind. It's actually much nicer to be kind than to be, you know, um, successful. You'll be successful yeah. if you're kind because you'll you'll be successful in, in people's eyes. And, and, you know, and for young people as well, to always remember, uh, you know, that uh, what you do will be remembered long after what you said. Yes, agreed. And then the second question is, what is the meaning of life? Well, for me, the meaning of life is, is uh, you know, to do your best uh, to, to leave a mark of some description, whatever that is, whether it is in sport or whether it is in socially or whether it is in the job or in the family or whatever, to leave a mark, to do your best uh, to leave a mark, to make a difference. Uh, not just to go through life, uh, but to live life. And by living life, uh, to lead, to, you know, to care about others uh, and to help others in some way, whatever that is possible. And to, you know, that when you're, you know, when it's all over, uh, can you, you know, say on your deathbed, you know, I did my best and I made a difference. And uh, if you can say that I made a difference in a positive way now, and particularly made a difference for those who might be struggling or whatever. And uh, for me, that's what life is about. It's about that, making a difference, leaving a legacy of something that other people will be able, will recognize that, you know, he or she did something that made a difference. And that's an all ongoing challenge. And it's there every day of how you live because it has not got to do with age. Uh, you know, when you're young, you have energy and you can do things. When you're older, you have wisdom. And I suppose the one thing you realize when you get older is, you know, how little you know. And that's a great old balancer for life. <laughs> it absolutely is. John Lonergan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for your time. Thanks.